as a springtime ring To have a friend right in your corner Your heart will feel a little warmer Tender, loving Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Greenbrier Almond. Thank you for coming into our home today uh, here at 48 South Canoa Street in Buchanan, West Virginia, uh, for our program Tender Loving Care. And I'm very happy to uh, show off uh, a stained glass artist rendering of a, a fable. Uh, Pam Adams has been on our program before. Uh, she's a, a glass artist, stained glass artist here in Buchanan. Her work is on display at Artistry on Main, uh, along with 38 other different artists, actually. And it's a wonderful uh, addition to the city of Buchanan, Upshur County, West Virginia, uh, to have all these artists uh, showing their works right here in Buchanan. <coughs> well, almost as soon as my wife, uh, Arasili, uh, saw this uh, rendering of, a, of this fable of a little fairy princess, uh, uh, it caught her attention. Now, my wife's a pediatrician. Uh, she loves children. Of course, we have our own children, now granddaughters. And uh, maybe there's a, a many, many ways, facets of interest that we have uh, for uh, thinking about fables and fairy tales now in this time of life. But, but certainly, uh, Pam Adams uh, caught our attention, caught my wife's attention with this wonderful stained glass rendering. Pam tells me, and I have, I have the fable I'm going to be telling you here in a minute, uh, that when she was a little girl, she heard the story of the little fairy who would not keep herself clean. And maybe that's a way that uh, parents would teach uh, their, their kids to bathe and keep themselves clean. I mean, those fables have uh, morals behind them. <coughs> so anyway, uh, she, Pam heard this before and, and uh, was captured uh, captured her imagination as a little girl. And she kept the uh, image in her mind for years and years and years. And then as she became, uh, and she was a sign painter at one point, but as she developed an interest in stained glass, uh, she had gone to the Tiffany Museum in, in uh, Florida and saw what uh, Tiffany did with glass. And uh, she just fell in love with that medium. Uh, almost one of the first things she wanted to do was this childhood fable. And it took her uh, a whole winter to do it. It took her about six months to, of work to create this. So artists can you know, follow their dream as far as they can. And, and we were grateful. We're grateful to Pam Adams for following her dream. And, and we're glad that she and her husband live uh, on a farm out at Tomlinsville and, uh, and have followed their dream to West Virginia. And, and then uh, this rendering of stained glass uh, it is now in our home, and we're, we're very grateful for that. <clears throat> Let me share a little bit about the, the fable as itself. I have a, a copy of it here. Uh, this is uh, from a book called Wings of Flame, Everyday Fables by Joseph Burke. <coughs> Excuse me, Joseph Burke Egan. He was a headmaster at Harvard School in Massachusetts years ago. And uh, fables, of course, as I mentioned, uh, are ways that we can teach children lessons of life. And, and so this was, uh, this was uh, no different than that, I'm sure, uh, when uh, Professor and Headmaster Egan uh, wanted to uh, instruct his students about life. Uh, he starts in the beginning here in the, in the prelude, and I think it's worth mentioning, uh, that some stories take a lifetime to write. Uh, the, as he says, the covers of a mighty book uh, and in between the covers, uh, there are unwritten pages. And he goes on to describe a young man writing one page a day and putting it aside. Maybe a light coming over his shoulder, an inspirational light, the sun, God, you know, everything that that light represents, uh, inspiring him and showing him the path, but writing, writing every day. 
and then that person gets older and the head of the man grows gray and the, and the hands begin to tremble, but the writing goes on and on. And finally, the head is no longer in the great light. The shadow of the hand is gone from the page. And there's an angel that comes and writes across it in characters that all may read his autobiograph autobiography written in his daily deeds. So, so it's a, uh, he even writes in the prologue about how our life is spent. Uh, uh, what we do day by day is important uh, for the sum of our days. Um, <clears throat> and with that in mind, uh, I, I have grown up in the Methodist tradition, and uh, John Wesley's was famous uh, for a medical textbook that he wrote uh, back in, in the times of the early Americas. Uh, people uh, didn't have doctors, they didn't have um, uh, nurses, uh, all those things, that, hospitals, all those things that we might think about. But they would have a book by John Wesley, Practical Ways to Treat Illness. And, and uh, one of the things John Wesley was keen about was cleanliness. And cleanliness is next to godliness, is, is how he said it in his book. And, and I grew up uh, with a grandfather who was a Methodist minister, and my grandmother was a deaconess in the Methodist church, uh, and then my mother was born uh, <clears throat> and, when, and, 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 and grew up in the tradition of the Methodist church. And so they, they all three of them, and, and maybe many other people, said to me over the years, cleanliness is next to godliness, and we're always interested in, in being clean and cleaning up after a full day of play. Well, I think, I think the, uh, this, this uh, fable is about the same thing, uh, maybe in a, uh, a fanciful way. Uh, so here it is. Uh, there once was a little fairy who would not keep herself clean. So this represents the fairy, uh, and a beautiful fairy she is. Uh, we used to imagine fairies. My, I think my mother actually believed in fairies. Uh, at least she, she talked about them in a way that I thought she believed in them. And I always wanted to see one. I never did. Uh, I'm an old man now, uh, but I wouldn't mind seeing one, but, but I haven't had that experience. Uh, but anyway, this, this uh, fairy lived very much as I remember hearing my mother describe it, uh, in a, uh, among the tangled roots of a very old oak tree. And, there, and some people, if they came quickly upon the oak tree, they would find crocuses. Um, and there was a queen of the fairies, and the queen of the fairies lived there too. She was a very beautiful fairy, and she had a silver crown, and she had a star flower uh, and, and, and the, in her hair, and uh, she had coral-collared uh, uh, cheeks, uh, just like a mushroom, uh, it's described. And she loved clean things. And uh, she used to take thistle down and take a dew bath every night. Again, I remember as a child how thick the dew was. We'd play outside until it got dark and sometimes uh, catch lightning bugs even after dark. And, you know, after a while, uh, the ground would be thick with dew. I don't know if children get out enough now to play outside enough to appreciate how thick the dew can be. But, but uh, this, this uh, fairy godmother... Uh, takes dew baths. Isn't that interesting? So uh, uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful story. And uh, so anyway, she looked down on this little fairy that was unclean with horror, and she refused to let the little dirty fairy come to her. Now the little fairy had a free spirit of her own, and actually she took pride in the fact that she was not too clean, uh, according to the fable here. Uh, she just liked being different that way. Uh, but the queen grew angry and said, you have to be banished from me for a month and a day. That sounds like a long time. It would be a long time when I was a child, when summers lasted forever. Uh, and of course, waiting for Christmas lasted forever as we go into our Christmas season 2014. But um, she, she, she said, you're banished from me until you learn how to, please, to clean yourself up. She told the, the fairy godmother told the little fairy, and, um, and so the little fairy began to wonder, where am I going to go if I'm banished? <clears throat> and then she remembered that there was in the queen's country, a uh, far distance away, another oak. Uh, and under that oak, there were supposed to be other fairies. And, and maybe there would be a, a place that she could go to. And so she hurried off in that direction, uh, thinking that she could get there uh, maybe before dark. 
And uh, when noon came, she was very hungry. And she, she went, got under a green eave of a rose bush. And, uh, and you know, I remember my grandmother's rose bushes too. And I'm glad that it's included in this fable. Uh, but uh, uh, grandmother uh, fed them all natural uh, materials, a lot of eggshells and things like that. Uh, but they were huge, uh, and there would be you could you could you could hide under uh, my grandmother's rose bushes, um, and and so she, anyway, the little fairy said, "Friend, rose spirit, may I have some of your golden pollen in your roses? I'm so hungry." Again, if you look carefully at a rose, you do see the golden pollen in a rose, and it, it adds to the beauty of a rose. Uh, the rose spirit turned away. Uh, turned 20 lovely rose eyes uh, toward uh, the, the little fairy, and her eyes got wider and wider with astonishment. And she said, an unclean little fairy, cried the rose spirit. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Who ever heard of such a thing? Go right away. You must and touch one of my beautiful petals. Well, that broke the little fairy's heart, didn't it? And uh, so she, she had to run away. <clears throat> but she's still hungry, so she goes along her way toward that big oak, and uh, she comes to a bumblebee uh, that's hidden away at the bottom of a daisy plant. Now, I've noticed this to be true, too. I have a wildflower garden. Many people notice that in our home and uh, appreciate it, and we're glad that it's there for people to see. But we have wonderful daisies that bloom. And, and at the base of the daisy, there, there are bumblebees. That's where they like to go there. So uh, whoever, uh, uh, Mr. Pro Professor Engel, uh, as he wrote this, uh, Egan, Egan, Professor Egan, as he wrote this, um, uh, he knew about flowers, didn't he, and, uh, and about bumblebees. And, and he even describes the bumblebee as having a yellow waistcoat and a gorgeous plush pants. And I, I've thought of bees, too, as being dressed up like that, uh, maybe like a clown also, uh, but something fanciful about, about that. And of course, this is a fable, and animals talk to each other, and it makes it all delightful for children. Uh, but anyway, he, he sees the dirty fairy, and he says, I've been washing my face with one foreleg and then the other until my cheeks shone like the finest silk. And, he, and, uh, and so he's, he's, he's stern. He says, I don't have any honey for dirty people. Now, there's justice here. Now, in America, there's political correctness and so forth. We might not be harsh on children. We might be harsh on each other. Or at least we, we, we say that politically correct. But, but still, I understand uh, the bumblebee had a right to be stern, didn't he? And, and he had a right to say, I, I don't, I'm not going to give my honey away to someone if they're dirty. And uh, he says, I wash my own face and comb my hair between jobs, and I see no reason why. I should, give, I should do work for those who don't do that. Get out of here, he says, and I'll, I'll bunt you well. I don't know the word bunt, but I probably need to look that up, but I'll bunt you well. Not sting, but bunt. Um, and uh, anyway, he's, he's banishing the little fairy on, his, on her way. And so the fairy ran off, and he came, next came to some ants. And she told the ants, I'm so hungry, uh, and you live in the dirt. Ant hills are in the dirt, aren't they? Uh, she said, you don't mind the dirt. Uh, I'm a dirty little fairy, but, um, but I'm hungry. Would you, would you give me some food? And, and the ants are surprised. They say, well, we wash and scrub 100 times a day. Uh, we may live in the dirt, but we, don't, uh, we clean ourselves with our forelegs and we clean our faces just like kittens do. And, and so I, after I began to read this uh, and, and look at this uh, wonderful stained glass, uh, Wenda, I, I begin to think about the, the ants, too, and, and they do. They clean themselves up just like a, a kitty cat will, you know, rubbing their head across their ears and licking themselves. And ants do the same thing. If you, if you are out next spring in the summer uh, and ants are crossing your yard or your sidewalk or your, your garden, you look at them and see how they clean themselves up. But the ants said, we wash ourselves. Uh, we don't. Um, so you can't have any of our uh, food. And on the way, she came to a buttercup. So our little, a little fairy is going on her path, and the buttercup is just uh, her size. And, and it is, she, it's like a, like a uh, sink uh, filled with dew. 
It's a golden bowl with, filled with the purest and sweetest morning dew, uh, the, the fable goes. Little buttercup, whispered the fairy softly, let me wash my face and hands in your golden bowl. Oh dear, oh dear, said the buttercup. I was saving that dew for the fairy queen. What will she think if she finds it all dirty and grimy, as it will be if you wash your face in it? And of course the little fairy wanted to hear no more of that, and so she ran away. This time she came to a brook. And, there, and here we have a brook, okay? So now we have the scene uh, which uh, Pam Adams is portraying in stained glass. And look, there's a little waterfall at the back of the brook, and there's a goldfish in, in the brook. And here's, here's the fairy, uh, the little fairy uh, princess uh, washing herself, uh, have a, having some water in her hand and washing herself. So anyway, she comes to the fairy brook, uh, or to the little brook, and it's sauntering gaily along its mossy rocks, and it's humming its throat with happy tunes. And if you listen to brooks, they are happy, aren't they, in their sound. And as a child uh, or with a grandfather having grandchildren, I, I want to take my kids to a brook and let them listen to the sound of a brook. And, and of course, see all parts of this, uh, this fable, this fairy tale. Uh, and so the little, the little fairy says, may I wash my face in your clean water, Mr. Brook? And the brook says, yes, indeed, that's what I'm for. That's why I'm here. That's why I sing. My job is to keep the whole world clean, he says. And see, I polish my stones, and I see how the clear sky reflects. And here it sees the blue, and of course the, they don't see the sky in this scene, but, but the reflection of the blue. As I walk uh, over to the college and walk around the, uh, the river trail there, I, I look into the river often, and indeed on a, a blue sky day, uh, the river is blue. It reflects that color back. Uh, this time of year, it's uh, pretty green. Uh, we don't have much sky uh, that's colorful, but uh, the river then takes on a dark green color. But it's blue on the sunny, sunny days. And, uh, and then he says, look how shiny my fish look, uh, the brook says. So wash away as hard as you please. In order that your task will be easier, I'll even hold up a mirror for you to see your face. And of course, when you look into a very quiet pool of water, it's, uh, it, it's, it like, it's like a mirror, isn't it? And a wonderful mirror, actually. <coughs> and then with a happy cry, the fairy knelt on the bank and washed herself until the face that laughed back at her was rosy as the dawn. So here she is washing, 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 getting her uh, face as rosy as the dawn. Again, a wonderful image from this fable. Uh, I see why Pam Adams fell in love with this as a child. Uh, the dawn is rosy often, and, and it's beautiful to get up. Uh, this time of the year, um, I get up and walk early. I like to uh, enjoy the dawn, and, and uh, between 7 and 8 o'clock, uh, there's a dawn, and often it's, it's very rosy. Uh, so again, this uh, writer of the fable understands nature very well. It says, uh, so she, there's an old goldfish there that swims up and looks at her out of one eye. You know, here, see, the, again, the fish has, the, the, the bee, or the, the ant has, the bee, the bee has 50 eyes, or 100 eyes. You could, and he mentions that in the fable, the eyes of the, of the bee. Uh, but, but here, the, the fish has one eye. Of course, one eye is on the other side of the head. But uh, the, the, uh, the writer of this fable is, is true to, to nature. So the old goldfish looks out of one eye and then the other. He says, don't forget the backs of your ears, said the goldfish. No, indeed, answered the little fairy. Don't leave a black ring around your wrist, said the goldfish. So the goldfish is like a, an uncle or a grandfather, like I am instructing my granddaughters. Uh, you know, get rid of that ring around your wrist. Uh, uh, get a, get that, don't forget uh, under your chin in the back of your neck, you know. And of course, we, we always had to wash our ears out. My mother was always saying, uh, she'd look in our ears and say, oh, there's enough dirt in there uh, for, uh, to plant a, a hill of potatoes. And uh, so that, meant, that was a lot of dirt to us. Uh, and we'd have to clean out our ears. But anyway, so the little fairy says, thank you kindly for your advice. Now tell me, am I clean enough to go to the fairy queen's court? 
I'll ask the minnow, said the goldfish. The minnow, of course, is also in the, in the pools of water, little brooks. You'll see them, many of them in West Virginia. Uh, and the minnow says, I'll ask the trout. And then, and then the uh, trout fish says, I'll ask the sunfish. And of course, all these are growing uh, fish that you see in our brooks in West Virginia. But then, before any one of them could answer, the little fairy leaped up and ran as fast as she could. I'm glad to record that the fairy queen smiled on her and invited her to sit quite close to the throne on a green mullein leaf in the shadow of a lovely brown butterfly. So that's the rendering of our fable. Uh, we may have a few minutes to talk about it. I, I asked Rodney to uh, talk a little bit about um, the time we have left to share uh, something about, about children's fables uh, and the value of them uh, in raising children. Um, I, I have the pleasure of being on the school board and, and, and uh, we have early childhood education, we have, of course, pre-kindergarten, kindergarten, Head Start. All these programs are uh, very important for children because uh, the mind is active and developing quickly. <clears throat> but what, par what can parents do, or grandparents, aunts and uncles? You can read to your children, to your babies, uh, and uh, it's important, very, very important. Uh, make all the difference in the world. Uh, I would say the Wings of Flame, Everyday Fables, uh, this particular one uh, caught Pam Adams's eye. When, how old was she? Maybe she was two years old when she first heard it. Uh, but it stayed with her all her life. Uh, and then when she became an artist, she wanted to, it was so, so important to her, she wanted to create something beautiful uh, to, to express what it meant to her. Uh, but, but for children, uh, and I'm very pleased to see that, that uh, my daughter and, and son and uh, uh, my daughter's husband, uh, my son's wife, uh, with, the, with the granddaughters, they read every night. And the children love to be read to. And they have, they have their favorite books, uh, some books they almost like to hear every night. Uh, uh, imagine imagine uh, Pam Adams would have wanted to hear about the little fairy that could not keep herself clean many times. And that's okay. Uh, maybe that shapes uh, who people are. My, my son was interested in a dragon, a story of a dragon, and he wanted that story all the time. And uh, so, so uh, maybe he's out there uh, as a lawyer uh, slaying dragons. I mean, in, in a way, that's what they say lawyers do. So uh, that's a... Um, uh, it had an effect on his life in, in ways that we'll never know at the unconscious level. Uh, but children who are read to uh, will do very well in school. And, and uh, the reason to get a head start uh, in school is that there's so much to learn. We, we were just in the Holy Land and we learned that in Israel they go to school six days a week. And, and, and uh, the United States is now 17th in the world in education. I mean, this is how you measure it, the 13th, 18th, 20th. But anyway, we're not number one. We're down the line. And ahead of us are nations like Singapore and China and Israel and Finland. And there are several nations that stand out, often, often in the educational literature, are mentioned. And then we go to see what, the, what, are, what are they doing there that we're not doing here in America with our children. And one of the things is uh, we're not reading to our children as much letting the TV be the babysitter. Now, I'm watching, you all are watching me on TV, and I'm, I'm grateful for that. So I'm not against TV, of course. And uh, I'm, I, I think the particular educational local access TV is very important for our community that we have that. And I'm great, grateful for Rodney Irwin, and, uh, who keeps it up and, and uh, is enterprising uh, that it, it keep improving it. But, uh, but nevertheless, uh, the TV is not a babysitter. We shouldn't let children just watch TV or, or put them in front of a TV, and they'll be captivated by the images and movement and so forth. But we should, we should let them develop their own imagination through reading. And, and fables and, and fairy stories and Bible stories will inspire children. Another comment along this line that I think is important to say is, is as you look at this beautiful rendering of a, of a fable from Pam Adams' earliest childhood, <clears throat> would be with the Bible stories themselves are perhaps more vivid than almost anything, any fable or any other story that you can imagine. 
and over the years, as, uh, as I've taken care of children, I, at one point I had over 500 children when I was at the Rock Cave Clinic and, and uh, taking care of children who've been referred by school teachers and, and principals and so forth, parents, grandparents, many of them for disruptive behavior in classrooms. And, and anyway, I would I begin to ask the children their story of their life and, and understand what's happening to them. And I found out that they did not understand uh, fables. They didn't understand the stories of the Bible. And one that I would go to fairly quickly because I was trying to make a point about hope and promise and possibility would be the, the story of the rainbow. And, and I also probably went to that story more often because my mother loved rainbows. Uh, she she uh, lived up on a hill and, and, uh, and we would have rainbows out our front uh, door. She could look out our front door and across the hill and it would often be rainbows. And, and, and she'd always have her camera ready to take a, another picture of another rainbow. And uh, so anyway, the rainbow story I would like to tell the children and, and it's, of course, the story of Noah and the flood. And uh, children didn't know the story. I mean, I was surprised. I, at one point, I had found about five kids out of 500 who knew the story of Noah and the flood. They may know something about Mickey Mouse. They may know something about other, other characters of our culture, but, but they, didn't, they didn't know the story of Noah and the rainbow. Well, that's a promise of God. After, after the earth is flooded, uh, and and uh, all people are wiped out except for Noah and his family. And he has all the animals on the ark. And children love animals too, so that's a great story for children. <coughs> but but uh, when they finally land on a mountain, probably in Turkey, uh, if you follow the Bible uh, details and try to find out where it is. But anyway, they, they land there and, and they, they get off the boat and, and God puts a rainbow in the in the heaven, an ark, of, and, it's, and it's there to tell them as a promise that God will never flood the earth again. It's not that the earth will not come to an end someday, but it will not be flooded again. And, and that's part of the promise of God. So the rainbow is a very uh, vivid image in my heart, in my mind. And I, I could, but I could not believe, as a doctor trying to, to uh, uh, teach children something that will help them live, that they didn't know the story of the rainbow. Many other stories, you can go to American history. Uh, our children are not being uh, fed well, I don't believe, on, on stories of, of the pilgrims. Uh, stories of why did we come here for religious freedom? Uh, why, did we, uh, 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 why did the pilgrims uh, put up with the harsh winter here? Why didn't they stay in England? Uh, but they wanted to get away from, from being persecuted uh, for their faith, and they wanted a place where they could worship. And, Different, different states had different origins. Maryland was basically a Catholic state. Pennsylvania was basically a Quaker state. Uh, the Congregational Church was settling in Rhode Island. Uh, the Appalachians uh, were filled with Methodist and, and Baptist. And, you know, and so it goes, uh, if, you, if you learn the early history of America, uh, the, the, we, we people came here with their various faiths and they, they settled and, and that became important traditions. Uh, our own, our own Community of Buchanan has many mountains named after Bible locations. Mount Nebo uh, is where we have a farm, and, and that's also where Moses stood as he looked into the Promised Land. And so all these things are in the Bible, and they mean more if you can know them. Uh, but a, cable, a fable uh, and a child read to, uh, I want to, I guess, testify by this, this rendering by Pam Adams, uh, changed her life. Uh, I mean, I'm sure she's a very clean lady. I'm not, I'm not talking about her hygiene today, but, but she, learned, she learned a lesson from this fable about cleanliness. And, and uh, she also uh, uh, loved the image of a fairy and a fish that talked to each other and the imagination. Her imagination grew. And so then as a lady, she, when she got discovered that stained glass is something that she can be an artist with, then she, she knew how to make something beautiful and render it like this. Well, uh, this is a, a, a good beginning for a new year, uh, and I do wish you a new year. If you're still on your holiday break, your Christmas break, then Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Until the next time, this is Dr. Greenbrier Almond thanking you for joining us on our program, Tender Loving Care. Special thanks to Channel 3, as always, for uh, helping us come our way and making these programs uh, so uh, professional that you out there in uh, TV land want to watch them. So 
Read to your children. Have a great holiday. And we'll see you in the new year. Stories of a West Virginia Doctor, written by Dr. Harold D. Allman. A collection of 55 short stories about his experience as a small town doctor in central West Virginia. And tender loving care. Stories from a West Virginia Doctor, Volume 2, written by Dr. Greenbrier Allman. Using videotapes to write 70 additional stories of his father's very colorful life as a small town doctor. They can be found for purchase at Amazon.com and most local bookstores. Tune into Channel 3 Buckhannon for Tender Loving Care with Dr. Greenbrier Allman, where he talks about the connection between Christianity and medicine.